welcome everybody. We're glad you could come. Uh, this is again the Night Can Be Deadly for Birds presentation. So this is in partnership with Sally, o uh, Sally Owe and myself. I am the program coordinator for Detroit Audubon. My name is Brittany Like, and I'll let Sally go ahead and introduce herself. Hi everybody, I'm Sally Uwe. I'm a professor of astronomy at the University of Michigan and uh, just want you all to know that I'm not a biologist, but I have learned a lot in preparing for this talk, which has been fascinating and I hope you find it fascinating too. Um, I am the coordinator of a community group called Michigan Dark Skies and it's an advocacy group to uh, promote awareness about artificial light at night and light pollution. And we do have a pretty big group, well, by my standards, it's, it's over 250 people now, and we have leadership members from a variety of different environmental organizations um, that you see listed here, as well as some others. And of course, including Detroit Audubon. So uh, very happy to be here and also want to thank Heidi Trudell of Washtenaw Safe Passage, who also helped us with material for this presentation. Sorry. It's all right. <laughs> all right. So I figured I'd go ahead and start out with uh, kind of a really basic question for everybody, and that's why do birds migrate? So in short, uh, basically, birds need to move from areas of low resources to areas of high resources, or basically they need to follow the food. Um, but then what triggers migration? So in short, they are driven by weather and the availability of food. Uh, a large effect on whether they migrate or not is whether they can find enough food. Factors that affect weather are the combination of changes in temperature and length of day. Um, for instance, spring, you have longer days and increasing temperatures, while in the fall, you have shorter days and decreasing temperatures. And then finally, you have your genetic disposition or predisposition. predisposition. So then another good question is how do birds migrate? Uh, science has found they depend on multiple methods ranging from a combination of senses, the sun and stars, maybe even sensing Earth's magnetic field, landmarks, preferred pathways, and then stopover points. So when it comes to birds, they actually will utilize not necessarily just one thing. Sometimes it's multiple um, or even maybe a, mix a mixture of all of them. And But and basically, you'll, uh, we'll talk more about this a little bit later in the presentation, so I won't get into all the specifics. So how do birds prepare for migration? As temperatures drop in the fall, they prioritize fattier foods to build up their body fat. Um, you'll see here on the bottom right, there's actually a picture of uh, a bird, looks like it's possibly a house sparrow. It's, you'll see on the left, kind of maybe a little bit skinnier, maybe more bones visible underneath the feathers. Um, that's pre-fat or even maybe um, after migration. So they've used up all of their fat. And then on the right, you'll see a fattier section of uh, the skin under the feathers. More than likely, that's probably double their body weight and fat that's needed in order to make those migrations successfully. Another major point that helps for uh, birds prepare for migration is they molt their seasonal feathers. Again, another perfect example of this type of bird uh, or a bird that loses them, and you'll see that visibly, would be the American goldfinch. The males go through a big color change where in the spring, most people will see those bright yellow feathers on the male um, versus in the winter, they actually look a lot more like the females. And that's kind of a grayish brown color um, they'll still have similarities like on the wings, but um, they lose a lot of those seasonal feathers um, at various times of the year. And by doing that, they're actually able to become more aerodynamic, which helps them fly a little bit easier. And lastly, the other method that they use to help with migration is they'll actually reduce their sleep time. That way they can spend more time in the air, want more time flying. And then sometimes even some birds will take naps during their flight, which I personally think is amazing. I mean, there's no way I could walk and sleep at the same time, yet birds can fly and sleep at the same time. <laughs> so next slide. So we have four very basic types of migration. Um, 
you say migration, but the real reality is one of them is residents, those birds that really just don't migrate at all. You have um, a lot of times it's your blue jays, sometimes your cardinals, uh, robins, some of those birds maybe used to migrate, but really don't do that much anymore. Um, you have your short distance migrants, which in a lot of ways is kind of something along the lines of maybe over a couple of towns or a couple of states. So not nearly as far from migration. Then you have your nomadic and irregular migrants. And so those are the birds kind of, like I said, the blue jays is a perfect example in robins where technically they can be considered more residents now, but other birds sometimes will actually move with the food. So sometimes they'll migrate further, sometimes maybe just the next town over, or even just a house over if they need to, if they can find the food. And so those are your more irregular migrants. And then you have the more common migrants and that's the long distance migrants, the ones that typically migrate from continent to continent. And for instance, North America to South America and then back. Um, my favorite bird of those migrants is the Arctic Tern. And they've actually been very well known to migrate from pole to pole and have one of, if not the longest migration of any other bird. And so, um, yeah, those are your four basic migrant uh, migrations. Next slide. So here we have four of the, the four migration flyways that we have in North America, the Pacific, Central, Mississippi, and Atlantic. And so most people have probably heard of the Mississippi because that's what we're in. Michigan is located in the Mississippi flyway. Now, when you look at the different my, uh, flyways, Mississippi has more than 325 bird species that utilize this flyway. And then the central has more than 380 species that use their flyway. You'll see here on this picture, there's really some nice man-made distinctions for what each of those flyways are. However, if you move on to the next slide or the next picture, one more, there we go. So here, this is probably more what it would look like for a lot of bird species. What we had for the original picture is typically what most people look at when it comes to those migration flyways. But in reality, it's, there's a lot of crossover. You will have to excuse my cat in the background. She likes to be in, <laughs> engaged. Um, but anyway, so there is a lot of crossover. So for instance, you will see the blue, which is the Mississippi flyway, some of them actually go all the way over into the Pacific Flyway. So there's actually a lot of overlap or a lot of birds from the Atlantic will use the Mississippi Flyway. So all in all, there's a lot of crossover when it comes to these flyways, but they're still as a whole largely distinctive between the four. Next slide. Then you have your major factors affecting migration. So I've kind of hinted at it a little bit and that it's not necessarily always exactly the same, um, but weather data shows that many North American bird species are shifting their spring migration by two days each decade. Now, when you look here, you'll actually see the climate change is kind of, for the most part, one of the major things affecting that migration. And that's whether it's from the growth of new plants, maybe those plants are growing in areas they didn't used to be. Um, quite often that's usually what people are calling invasive species, um, but it's not necessarily only invasives, but the growth of new plants is affecting that, uh, which means it's a reduction of resources. The timing of spring blooming is a huge factor that's being affected by that as well as the abundance of insects and food. Now, when you look to the right, this image does a good job of relaying how climate change is affecting migration for birds. Uh, basically with earlier migration, chicks hatch sooner than food is available, which lowers their survival rate. And you can kind of see in this picture how you'll have normal spring versus early spring. And you'll see how with an earlier spring, they arrive sooner than the food is available, which is a big factor in why some of these birds, maybe their chicks don't survive as easily as they used to because there's less food available, which is a big problem. Then moving into pesticides, they affect the abundance of insects and food, which causes confusion, disorientation, refusal to eat, which in effect eventually slows down the flying time, which 
has a negative effect on their ability to migrate successfully or at the ability, at the time they need to have it get arrive in these locations. So, um, and then finally, the loss of habitat affects their ability to migrate more easily and successfully. With fewer habitats and stopover points, it becomes more difficult to migrate as far because there's less food available. Next slide. Oh, ooh, that got a little. There we go. All right. So here you're going to see four separate pictures. Oh, they look almost exactly the same, but this first picture is you'll see in the bottom left corner, it's highlighting the year 2000. So this is what the range map was for the common loon in the year 2000. And it's showing the winter and summer range of the common loon. So as you move on to the next slide, so 2020, you'll see there's a slight adjustment. And you'll actually also see this outline of the yellow and the blue. The yellow being the summer range, the blue being the winter range. And as each of these years go by, so when you hit 2050, it moves up even further. So again, that's uh, an adjustment to their range over the years. And so 2000 and 2020 were accurate and 2050 and 2080 are predictions. But as you get to 2080, you'll see even further how far it's moved up. And at this point, it's not even really in those original ranges at all maybe a little bit in the winter range, but the summer range is barely touching the original range in any capacity, which just really goes to show how, whether it's climate change, pesticides, or habitat loss, it is affecting ranges for various species, but in different capacities. This is just a really good example. Um, but you'll also want to note, which it's not really showing here, but um, basically this image when if you were to go to their website, it actually tells you that 90%, uh, there's a 90% decrease in the summer range and only a, there's a 20% decrease in the winter range. And so not only is it moving from where it was, there's also a decrease in available habitat, which has a huge factor and effect on these birds. So next slide. So then I'll finally kind of just touch on two types of migrants. So that's daytime versus nighttime. Now, when I think of daytime, and I'm sure a lot of people can relate, I think of the fall time when hawks are migrating and you look up and there are thousands of hawks flying overhead. It is amazing, it's breathtaking, um, but that's a perfect example. They are strong flyers. And it's those strong flyers, as well as the birds that typically spend most of their life flying, such as your chimney swifts or your swallows, that are the daytime migrants. Your nighttime migrants are more of those species that are like your songbirds or birds that depend on denser habitats. Now, those are species such as your warblers, your sparrows, maybe your orioles or any other type of songbird that you typically will find, birds again that, that will, you'll play songs or you'll hear them via song, which is always really fun to learn if you have the opportunity. But for those species, they are more of a prey species. So you'll have your predatory hawks and other creatures that are uh, hunting them. And so they're more of a prey species. Now, by being a nighttime migrant, there's actually a lot of benefits to those species. And that's things such as cooler nighttime temperatures, calmer winds or weather. And then again, that added protection against predators. So um, it's really a good portion of birds, most of them, honestly, are nighttime migrants. And so that's where this takes effect into night can be deadly for birds. And I'll take hand this over to Sally. Right. So thank you so much, Brittany, for that wonderful overview to place all of this in context. Um, I'll be talking a little bit more about the details of how birds do navigate at night. Um, and as Brittany just described, this is such an important phase in birds' lives. Um, it's a very long, difficult, and dangerous journey, and birds spend a lot of time preparing for it, as she explained. Um, and so, uh, you know, how this all takes place is something uh, of, a, of a real miracle. Now, at night, of course, we have artificial lights also, and I'll be definitely explaining more about how that impacts the bird navigation, and then more about what we as humans can do to mitigate the problems that we are causing for our feathered friends. 
So basically, birds, as it turns out, do navigation at night by some of the same ways that we humans do. And one of the principal ways that they do that is by celestial navigation. Now, here in the Northern Hemisphere, we are kind of often simplistically reducing it to looking for the Big Dipper that you can see right here. And many of you probably know that the Big Dipper has these pointer stars and that they point to Polaris, which is the North Star. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Okay, so we look for Polaris um, and we see, aha, that's the direction of North. Well, birds actually do something similar to that. And what birds do is they can identify Polaris by the circling of the night sky like this. And that becomes more obvious when you do uh, this long exposure photography where you can actually see very clearly how the North Star is very close to the, the polar axis of the Earth's rotation. That's really how birds figure out where North is. So they need to be able to see the sky turning, as you can see in this uh, time-lapse photograph here. This was discovered more than 50 years ago through these two famous studies. Basically what happened was that uh, the, the researchers decided to raise birds in a planetarium to figure out how it was that they figured out where North was. They raised three batches of birds, one in the planetarium showing no stars, another in the planetarium with the normal sky that turned around the star Polaris, and then a third batch, which had basically the same thing, but that the sky turned around the star Betelgeuse in the constellation Orion instead, which is this star over here. And basically what they found was that these baby birds in batch A, which were not exposed to any stars at all, could not do celestial navigation. The ones in batch B with the normal sky behaved normally with the north being Polaris. And the batch that were raised under C where the pole star was Betelgeuse thought that Betelgeuse was north. So in fact, it turns out that young birds really do learn celestial mechanics. They need to see the sky turning at night and that's how they identify where north is. So they need to be able to see how the sky turns like this. And as you can imagine, if there is a brighter sky than normal, that makes things a little bit more difficult. So artificial light at night, which is abbreviated as ALAN, Allen impedes bird navigation because it reduces the number of stars that they can see to notice how the sky is turning. I also want to look at the south. So here we are looking south from the northern hemisphere. Again, the sky is turning, but it's a bit more difficult to see where exactly south is because the axis of where the Earth, uh, you know, the projection of the Earth's axis to the south pole is beneath the horizon. So that means that we're really just looking at stars turning about the southern horizon. So it's not as accurate if you're facing south. You can also see that if there are artificial lights down here on the horizon, that that can have a greater impact when facing south because you're so focused on the horizon. So once again, if you have a lot of uh, enhanced brightening of the night sky, you see fewer stars and one can again see that it's more difficult to navigate and figure out where south is. Also under these conditions where you have a, an artificially brightened sky, you can also see that these lights along the ground seem to take on a, a greater significance, which can also be confusing for birds. So I've suggested that, you know, the more stars you can see in the sky, the easier it is to see it's turning. So how many stars do we lose just from what we call light pollution? Well, here is typically what you might see from a mid-sized city. I'm located in Ann Arbor and Ann Arbor is a mid-sized city. And this is pretty much what the constellation of Orion looks like. You can see the bright stars, the familiar belt and so forth. But if we are way out in the countryside in a truly natural dark environment, this is what the sky should look like. And to the naked eye, you can see tens of thousands of stars under these conditions. 
In Ann Arbor, you could typically just see maybe a couple hundred stars. So basically, we have lost 99% of the stars that are visible to the naked eye just by brightening the sky in the fashion that I just demonstrated. So another way that birds navigate at night is using a magnetic compass. Once again, the same way that people navigate. Well, similar. So people have devices that they create that are magnetic compasses. There's some controversy as to whether humans actually have a biological magnetic compass. But suffice it to say, the vast majority of us don't use it. We use the little device magnetic compass that we have. Um, and birds have a very sophisticated biological magnetic compass. People are still trying to understand exactly how it works, but it seems to be based on this, this molecule, uh, a type of cryptochrome molecule, as they call it, that is activated by ultraviolet light. And this creates a pair of proteins and the interaction of these proteins with each other and with the magnetic field of the earth can somehow tell the birds whether the magnetic field is inclined downward or upward. And so if this is the earth over here and you're in the Northern hemisphere, if the magnetic field lines are inclined downward, you can see that you're facing North. And if they're inclined upward, then you can see that you're facing in the opposite direction. This magnetic, excuse me, this magnetic compass uh, mechanism, as I mentioned, activated by ultraviolet light, but with very low light levels. So it's capable of working at night as well, even though you'd normally think there's very little ultraviolet light at night, but it really doesn't take much and it apparently really does work at night as well. And then some species of birds are also known to have a ferromagnetic compass, meaning that they actually have some magnetite in their beaks. Pigeons are a, a very well-known example of this. And so that works like the human compass, the, the device that we build. Um, that points to the magnetic north pole of the Earth. Another way that birds navigate is by the polarization compass. So birds, as it turns out, can see polarized light. So what is polarized light exactly? So light is the vibration of the electromagnetic field, and it will vibrate in waves that have a particular plane to them. So in this example, the plane is up and down, it's vertical. This other wave is vibrating horizontally. So basically light can, can vibrate in any plane that it wants to, but when you have polarized light, that means that they're all vibrating in the same plane. And that can be produced, for example, if you have a polarizing filter, like these polarizing sunglasses, for example, they will filter out the light that's going in any plane except the one that it's favoring. So that means that on the other side of the filter, you would have polarized light. The light is all vibrating in the same plane. So it turns out that birds can see that. And also it turns out that the sky has a very high fraction of polarized light. About 70 to 80% of the skylight is polarized. And it depends on uh, the, the plane of the polarization depends on the location of the sun in the sky. So here's the sun, this is the sky, and these are the plane of polarization that is in the sky. So as the sun moves across the sky, the polarization plane will change. So if the sun, for example, is setting in the west over here, and then it's north over here, you can see that the plane of the polarization will basically be completely up and down from north to south. And so that means that the, the plane of the polarization points exactly north-south at that moment. Birds know how the plane changes during the day. In fact, they can literally see that. Um, but it is kind of interesting that as the nocturnal migrators get started at dusk, you know, they're stirring, they're getting ready to go and they can literally see that the polarization happens to be pointing north, south. So the birds are taking off at night on their migration journey. And for the most part in North America, they don't see a very nice, pristine, dark, nat natural sky. They see something that's more like this and it's peppered with all of these regions that are contaminated with a lot of artificial light at night. 
And as it turns out, migrating birds are attracted to this urban artificial light at night, this Allen. Studies are finding that during the migration season, birds are found disproportionately near these large regions of Allen, near cities and towns. And why that is is not totally clear, but it should be noted that it's, it, is, it has been established that Allen disrupts the polarization of the sky that I just showed you. So for example, this is the pattern that you would find in the degree of polarization in a rural sky at night with the moonlit night, and then looking at the same region of the sky in an urban setting. And you can see basically that the pattern that you see that's caused by the polarization in the sky is completely wiped out in the urban setting. So most likely that causes part of the problem why when birds are near these urban Allen regions, they get disoriented and perhaps that makes it more difficult for them to leave those regions. And therefore they're ended up kind of near cities. Interestingly, it's been found that this prevalence of birds during the migration season being in cities is stronger during the autumn migration than during the spring migration. And the authors of that study suggested that this might be due to the fact that you've got more juvenile birds migrating in the autumn. And so juveniles might not be as experienced, they might not know how to navigate and they kind of get lost and stuck in cities. I would also suggest, however, that maybe it has something to do with the difficulty of navigating southward rather than northward, as I showed you earlier, with celestial navigation. So who knows? That's just my speculation as an astronomer. So once birds are attracted to these urban areas, there are some significant consequences for them. It's harder for them to identify good stopovers for one thing. As Brittany mentioned, you know, they really need to find good places to rest, to sleep, to find food and so forth on this very long journey. And then of course, when they get detoured, that means that the journey gets longer in the first place, which means that they may not have prepped enough for the longer journey that was unplanned for. And as we all know, that means you get tired. And when you're tired, you have diminished focus, you have diminished vigilance for predators and other threats your motor skills are down, your memory is down, everybody knows what it's like to be tired and that it makes you very vulnerable. And then when you're in an area where the sky is unnaturally bright, it also affects your circadian rhythms and this applies to birds as well. So that's the biological cycle between day and night. Your body relies on that and if it's messed up, it will have physical, mental and behavioral changes. On longer time scales, you also get effects that on the biological cycle. Uh, once again, as Brittany showed, you know, you've got a scenario where the length of days can influence, it does biologically influence when birds do their uh, different life cycle activities. For example, when they decide to migrate, when they decide to start building their nests and raising their young and so forth. And as she stressed, the timing is very, very important for birds, especially for these migrators where the migrating journey is such a large fraction of their lifetimes, then messing up any part of this biological cycle can really be important and have major consequences for them. And then once they're in an urban area, they're subject to all kinds of urban hazards, of course. And these include the number one killer of birds, which is cats, as you probably know, cats are where people are. And the number two killer of birds is buildings, when birds are crashing into buildings. As well, there's this situation where they get disoriented because the glare uh, of different polarized light can interfere with their navigation abilities. All of these smooth surfaces that you get in cities, especially glass like this, will produce polarized light as well. And it's polarized in different directions than what you see from the sky. So that will definitely disorient birds. And then it's also been suggested that perhaps, especially at night, wet streets can look like water actually, and that perhaps birds try to land on that and get injured. And then once you're in a city, there aren't the usual things birds look for, for safe spaces 
where there might be naturally occurring uh, grasses, bushes, thickets, and so forth. You don't find those in the city, and so birds are rather exposed to all kinds of predators. Actually, One thing, if you don't mind, if you don't mind me adding, yeah, with yeah, the please. asphalt water, it's another problem for uh, your diving ducks. Those birds that largely depend on open water, if they do land in those areas, they need water to be able to lift off again. And so, if mm. they land in these areas they're stuck. They cannot get enough, propor uh, enough, uh, I guess, pr uh, proportion or they can't get enough speed to be able to get up into the air again. And so it's a huge problem. Oh, thank you for mentioning that. Um, so one thing about being in cities also is that birds don't have very good depth perception. So you'll notice their eyes are, for most species, diametrically on opposite sides of their head, which gives them a fantastic range of view, they can see a much larger range around their head than we can, but that means they have terrible stereo vision. So that's one reason also that contributes to why birds crash into buildings so much, because by the time they've realized that this is a building, then, you know, they're, they're much closer than they, than a human might be under the same circumstances. So one issue also is that even on very small scales, birds seem to be attracted to very bright lights, individual lights even. So a famous example of this was the New York City tribute lights. Every year on 9-11, they shoot these incredibly bright beams of light up into the air from the footprint of the former tw Twin Towers. And these lights, trap thousands of birds. In fact, you can see in this picture, all of these white dots, these are birds that have been trapped by these lights. There's so many of them that they need to turn these lights off for 20 minute intervals in order to let the birds disperse. And then they turn them back on again. And of course, we don't know whether the same birds are coming back and getting trapped yet again. But uh, what's very vivid here is where they used weather radar to figure out how much uh, how many birds are being trapped. So here's the region where the tribute lights are, are being pointed. Uh, well, this is a kind of top-down view on the earth. So this is when the tribute lights are off. And then down here is when the tribute lights are on. And you can see this huge signal here and in indicating that on the order of 15,000 birds are trapped in that beam within just a region that's half a kilometer in size. So why this happens is not well understood. One idea that's been around for a very long time is that perhaps birds and also insects are actually trying to navigate by assuming that the light source is a celestial object, the moon, let's say. If the moon is located at a very large distance, essentially at an infinitely large distance because it's a celestial object, then if you're trying to go in some direction, you can just keep the moon at a fixed angle to that direction and you'll keep going in that direction. So the moon's always gonna be at that angle uh, from your travel. So you can just keep going like that. However, if the source is much closer to you, then what ends up happening when you keep that angle constant, let's say this is 60 degrees, then you keep 60 degrees toward that object and 60 degrees toward that object and you actually start spiraling all the way in, which is not what you had intended to do. And in fact, it's known that birds don't prefer to stop over in bright areas and yet they end up in bright areas anyway. So who knows? Uh, there are other ideas out there. It's certainly not conclusively demonstrated that this is what's going on, but it's an idea that's been out there for a while. So the degree to which birds are disoriented depends on what color of light is the contaminating source. And that also seems to vary by species. So for example, sparrows are disoriented by yellow and red colors at night. Seabirds are disoriented by blue and green at night. And then there also seems to be an issue of red light interacting with the magnetic compass in some birds. Again, it's not clear why this is happening because the magnetic compass depends on UV light. And so red light shouldn't have anything to do with that. But there's been a suggestion that maybe it has something to do with an interaction between the magnetic compass and the polarization compass. And so red light could be uh, 
affected by the affected, uh, the, sorry, the polarization compass could be affected by the red light. But anyway, uh, as mentioned, it's, it's not well understood how all of this works. And in general, different colors seem to affect different species. So again, once they are attracted to the city, then they are stuck with all kinds of other uh, hazards, the urban hazards that we mentioned, the crashes. They can, even when trapped around an area that's very small, like the 9-11 like the tribute lights, they, if there are so many of them like there were in that area, they can actually crash into each other as well. And they can definitely get exhausted when trapped in an area for such a long time so that such crashes end up happening. And of course, their travel ends up getting disrupted. So there's a lot of bird death in cities. Building collisions, as mentioned, are the number two cause of bird death. And it's believed that up to a billion birds are killed annually just by building collisions alone. This is something that's being studied by Professor Ben Winger at the University of Michigan here uh, in Ann Arbor. And this picture, for example, vividly illustrates some of the problem. This was the bird kill from one building in Ypsilanti in one day back in 2015 as collected by Washtenaw Safe Passage. So to try to mitigate some of these problems, there have been lights out programs that you may be familiar with. Um, in our area, there's the Safe Passage Great Lakes sponsored by Detroit Audubon. There's Washtenaw Safe Passage. In Toronto, there's Fatal Light Awareness Program, FLAP. And Chicago also has a lights out program. The GM Corporation has also participated in the Safe Passage Great Lakes. And then in, in Toronto, the Royal Ontario Museum puts on a display of dead birds collected every year. So uh, as Brittany mentioned, this is of interest for our particular neck of the woods because we are on this particular um, Great Lakes and uh, Mississippi flyway. So unfortunately, Allen is a problem that's increasing exponentially. This study showed what the US map looks like in the late 1950s for Allen, the mid 1970s, 1997, and then this is the projection for 2025. So unfortunately with new LED lighting coming on, LED lights are wonderful. They're very energy efficient. However, uh, they do, because they're so inexpensive, they do definitely promulgate a lot of artificial light at night. So the problem continues to explode. Here is the light pollution map for Michigan. And uh, this was in 2015. There are a couple of things to take away from this. The first is that there are still large areas in Michigan, especially in the UP. And there's also a couple patches in Northern Michigan, the lower peninsula that still have pristine natural dark skies. Another point is that for any given urban area that is causing light pollution and artificial light, the affected area is actually 10 times larger than the polluting city itself, as you can see from these maps. So the surrounding communities are all stakeholders in a given metro area's lighting and its lighting policies. So unfortunately, what we're looking at is an existential threat to the entire night ecosystem. Allen interferes not just with bird migration, but with all wildlife migration, with other activities that wildlife do, mating, feeding, and sleep. Animals and plants live by this 24-hour cycle that gets disrupted by artificial lights, and that includes humans. Humans are animals, too and we're only just starting to learn about the disruptions to humans. The Nobel Prize in Medicine was awarded in 2017 for discoveries relating to the circadian rhythms of humans, in fact. And most of the disruptions to human health have to do with disruptions to sleep and the artificially bright sky, and also glare that causes danger on roads. So we have a term here that we want to used to try to start figuring out what to do about this problem, and that is light pollution. That's different from artificial light at night, which is any artificial light. Light pollution specifically is light that is wasted and performs no function or task. So it's literally wasted energy. 
all of this light going up into the sky is basically wasted because it's not being used on the ground, which is where it's supposed to be helping. So to get a grip on light pollution, we can look at it in terms of three different kinds. There's glare, which is when you have a very, very bright light source against a dark contrast so that you can't see what's going on around you, very dangerous on the roads. There's light trespass, where light is going where it's unintended, for example, going into your neighbor's bedroom. So the ideal situation is to light only your own property and not the neighbor's. And then there's sky glow, which as we've discussed, causes the unnatural brightening of the night sky that has all of these biological consequences. From a human perspective, the International Dark Sky Association has also been uh, promoting awareness that blue light in particular for humans is also pretty negative. So blue light, first of all, scatters much more strongly than red light, up to 10 times more strongly. That spreads the footprint of the light pollution. In addition to that, blue light causes more disability glare and vision problems in people. And blue light destroys night vision more so than red, which is why astronomers run around with little red flashlights rather than little blue ones. So uh, the issue with blue light has also been called out by the American Medical Association, uh, in particular because of the disruptions to the circadian sleep patterns. So what can we do about this? Fortunately, the answer is that the solutions are easy. All we have to do are these four things. Light only what is needed, no more than what is needed, only when needed, and no bluer than needed. So basically, we need smart lighting, not more lighting. Here's an example of what happens when you don't have smart lighting. We think that we're lighting up this environment and we feel safe and everything's great. But look at how all of this lighting is actually lighting up the treetops. That's not what the birds want. The birds are probably not appreciating that. Well, we think we're lighting up the sidewalk here, but when we show the next image, I could tell you that that person is still in the same picture. And yet this lighting is not helping that scenario at all. I can back up for a second. You can see this person. Now you see them. And now you don't. Or if you were very quick to spot, you might see that the person is actually standing right there in the shadows. So when you have over illumination like this, it creates these dark shadows, which actually impede your ability to see. So it's a perfect example of not lighting well and over illuminating a scenario, which only worsens what you're trying to do. So the solutions, again, are pretty easy. All we have to do is use the so-called full cutoff or fully shielded fixtures, which means no light is emitted above a horizontal plane. So light is pointed downward and none of it is pointed upward. We can use timers, dimmers, and motion sensors to light only when needed. We can use warm white rather than blue rich lights. And then we can also raise awareness about this problem because most people just don't think about it. They don't deliberately cause lighting that isn't going where it's needed. They just don't think about it. And we can enact lighting ordinances to help this process along. In Ann Arbor, we passed an ordinance last fall and it specifies these exact same things, that exterior lighting should have warm colors, and that there should be no light trespassing beyond the property line. All fixtures shall be fully shielded and produce lighting that is pointed downward. And that there's a curfew for businesses after they're closed. And that we also have brightness limits on facade, canopy, and parking lot lighting. To the extent possible, we also have amortization of pre-existing lighting that is non-compliant. So you can start with your own home and look and see what kind of lighting you have that might be not quite uh, compliant with the fully shielded specifications. And if you decide that you want to change your lights out, all you have to do is a Google search on light fixture dark sky and you come up with lots and lots of options. The lighting industry is very much aware 
of the dark sky movement, and it doesn't have to be expensive. There are lighting designs for all kinds of budgets, large and small, and any kind of designs with, uh, for any kinds of tastes. And this is actually uh, a movement that is, has been in Michigan for quite some time. So Michiganders on the whole are fairly well aware of dark sky issues. In the free press a few years ago, there was a full front page article about this. If you just plug dark sky into MLive, you'll come up with dozens of articles about dark skies, our dark sky parks. Pure Michigan also uses this as an advertising campaign for tourists because dark skies in Michigan are now a very precious natural resource, especially with the Aurora Borealis, the Northern Lights, which are increasing now as we approach the solar max in the next few years. So that is a, a very big thing as well. Michigan is actually the first state in the union to enact, uh, well, to designate a dark sky park. And that was Lake Hudson Recreation Area right here in Southeast Michigan. Since then, uh, we have had five additional state parks that have been designated by the Department of Natural Resources. So we have six Michigan state parks that are dark sky preserves and they're shown on this map right here. In addition to this, the International Dark Sky Association has designated two parks in Michigan. These are both county parks, the Headlands International Dark Sky Park and Dr. T.K. Lawless Park in Cass County in Southwest Michigan. These have been designated as International Dark Sky Parks. Those are high quality dark skies where people can go and enjoy the natural phenomena associated with them. The International Dark Sky Association is the premier organization that advocates for dark skies in the world. And here in Detroit, there's also a certain level of awareness. In particular, Detroit has been designated as an urban bird treaty city by the National Fish and Wildlife Service. So it should be a relatively friendly city to birds, one that has made a commitment to make urban, the urban environment as friendly as they can for birds. Um, one example is that we have the North Corktown development that has specifically been designated to be bird friendly. And you can even see that they have a bird on their logo here. I mentioned earlier that the GM Corporation also participated in the Safe Passage Great Lakes program. And in fact, was received a, a plaque recognizing that support from Detroit Audubon and Michigan Audubon. And then you may remember that back when Ford Field started up with their purple lights glowing up into the sky, immediately 1,200 people signed this petition complaining about that so that they wouldn't turn them on for as long as they had originally been planning to do. So uh, over the last 10 years, as I mentioned, there has been uh, increasing awareness. Safe Passage Great Lakes Days was proclaimed to be uh, an action on the state of Michigan itself back in 2012, as well as in Ann Arbor. And then last year, the state Senate passed a resolution declaring that July of 2021 would be Dark Sky Awareness Month. This was a bipartisan resolution uh, initiated by Sen Senators Laceda and Bayer. Uh, Senator Kim Laceda is from Southwest Michigan and Senator Rosemary Bayer is from Oakland County. Uh, Laceda is a Republican and Bayer is a Democrat. So we had a bipartisan support for a Dark Sky Awareness Month declaration from the Senate. And then very excited to mention that tomorrow will be the kickoff for Dark Sky Week. And Governor Gretchen Whitchen, <laughs> excuse me, Governor Gretchen Whitmer has proclaimed next week, April 22nd to April 30th as Dark Sky Week in Michigan. International Dark Sky Week is sponsored by the International Dark Sky Association. You can find out more about it at IDSW, International Dark Sky Week, darksky.org. And then of course, the governor's proclamation is also online. So to summarize, basically, if we want to help, we light only what is needed, no more than what is needed, only when needed, and no bluer than needed. And this will help birds, it will help people, and it will help our planet. If anyone is interested in joining our group and getting on our mailing list, 
please check us out at michigandarkskiessites.lsa.umich.edu slash dark skies. And the International Dark Sky Association is at darksky.org. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now we'll go ahead and we'll start getting into questions. I did see uh, Rayon, I believe is your name. You asked, how about owls? And so I'm assuming you're as asking um, for the owls, whether or not they migrate or if they're affected by this for their migration. And to be honest, most owls that you can find here in Michigan really just don't migrate. They actually usually remain in, remain in the same territory for pretty much most of their life. And so migration doesn't really affect owls the same way it would some other species. Uh, and then we had um, someone said, thank you for the most informative presentations. So uh, we're glad we could help answer some questions. Same thing with Susan. She said, thank you and excellent. Um, does anyone else have questions? Um, we'd be more than happy to answer them. And feel free if you want to unmute yourself, you can ask it directly. You don't have to necessarily type it into chat at this point. Lots of thanks. Sounds like people are loving what they learned. Hopefully people will go through and uh, see what they can do to help. So every little bit helps, every little bit counts. Could I ask a question? Absolutely. Um, is this um, program recorded because I had to join late and I'm very interesting and I'm sorry, but I need to see the whole presentation. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, it's currently recording right now. And then I would say either by the end of the week or early next week, I'll have it posted and I'll email all the people that registered with a direct link so you can watch it later. Excellent. Thank you very much. No problem. I have a question. Okay. Um, you mentioned that uh, GM got this recognition for uh, darkening their, their towers downtown. What about other businesses down there and the skyscrapers? How receptive are they to turning out the lights? Ava, do you know the answer to that? Hi, yeah, I can help answer to that. I can help with that. Um, we, we have not been in touch with a lot of those larger buildings recently. Um, so I, I don't have too much information on that. I know that we did um, have a list of the buildings, um, but just because of capacity, we were not able to keep in touch with all of them. Um, so that is something that Detroit Audubon is looking to do is to kind of reach back out to these buildings and make sure that buildings are still um, turning off the lights at night during migration. Okay, also, um, so what type of light bulbs should be used for outdoor lights? You're saying, you know, no bluer than needed. So what type should we get? Well, the technical specification that people are pointing to is, it's called a color temperature. And the lower the number, the better it is. So right now the recommended color temperature is less than 3000 degrees Kelvin. And Oftentimes, this number should be on the boxes uh, of that light of the the, the light bulb. Um, but basically, you know, you're just basically looking at something that's sort of amber colored, yellow colored, rather than the super white kind of, you know, that looks like a fluorescent light kind of thing. Those you don't really want. You want something that looks more like a normal incandescent bulb color. Does that help? Yes. All Thank right. you for and that question. Yeah, another uh, question, which Sally, if you want to try and answer it, feel free. She, uh, Hillary says, I do not live in your area. So how do you suggest I motivate local people near me to care about dark skies? 
Uh, well, there are chapters of the International Dark Sky Association, in fact, that are around the country. So one thing you could do, and I don't know if you live in Michigan or not, if you live in Michigan, our group does, you know, cover all of Michigan, although a lot of our members are in Southeast Michigan. But if you're not in Michigan, um, the first place you can start is to go to the International, International Dark Sky Association's website. And they will have a listing on there uh, of their chapters nationwide. And if you want, you can contact me separately as well, and I can help you with that. Wonderful. Any other questions? And as well, uh, you know, just following up on that some more, the power of one is amazing also because um, we just had a woman in Warren who we'd been working with a bit, you know, and her building, she lives in a fairly large building and there was like some kind of business across the street that suddenly turned on this huge, you know, terrible lighting situation that caused this incredible light trespass onto that building. And so she just started contacting her neighbors who lived on that side of the building, put a flyer under people's doors and collected a group of maybe 10 or 12 people who were equally concerned about that. And uh, eventually, you know, with the different contacts that they all had, were able to confirm that that was not in compliance with the regulations in Warren and with that number of people were able to go to the building manager and to say there's a whole bunch of us that really don't like this and the problem actually got resolved that's awesome uh, barbara has a question she put is there are there press release material or is there press release material that could be shared with local newspapers uh, about what I, i'm assuming the dark sky problem that maybe to help advertise it a little bit better to local areas? Uh, well, the International Dark Sky Association definitely has public outreach materials. They have a lot of brochures and things that you can just download from their website. They are an incredible resource. They have, like, their, their website is a bit overwhelming. So once again, if you want to contact me, I can help you with that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, their website, darksky.org, will have very press friendly materials. Perfect. Uh, Kathleen actually put uh, excellent presentation. I'll be working on my neighbors to tone down the lighting. Thank you. That sounds really wonderful. <laughs> um, and then Rayon, he or they reached out again. So how can we collaborate for future events? Um, and then he was hoping to have an email ID to reach out to. So for those of you that um, would like, I'm gonna put my email in the chat. So you are welcome to uh, record that down. And so Sally, if you wanna do the same, just for ease, if people wanna just quick copy those down. I just put my email on there. And also, if you go to our website that's listed right here for Michigan Dark Skies, um, there's also an email contact there that you can plug in and it will get to us. And I just put mine as well. So then, um, yeah, so Rayon, as well as anyone else, you can reach out to us if you'd like to work on uh, any kind of collaboration. Maybe you want to, something that can help is sharing this video because then you don't have to worry about really learning nearly as much. You can just share the video with other maybe businesses, with organizations. You can copy the YouTube link once created and more easily share it, whether it's via text, on Facebook, you can do it and share it however you want. Um, you're more than welcome to, and that's a great way to do that. Um, it's a little long for some people, but that doesn't mean that it's not something that can be helpful. Um, we have various events that we go on birding field trips all the time. And so you can always, if you want, um, you can reach out to us via those methods and we can always see if there's some way we can offer a field trip that incorporates some of that. Maybe a late night field trip that we can talk about dark skies and the importance and what it can do. And so there's always ways that you can help and participate um, Nancy put, when trying to tackle the light pollution, how do you recommend going forward? 
local government or building business by business. So all of the above. Yeah. Uh, You know, whatever you have energy for local government is wonderful. It's a process, you know, you have to go through your planning commission and so forth, and you'll want to build a team to do that. Again, we can help you based on our experience in Ann Arbor. Um, But just business by business, you know, especially if it's a big business (laughs) like GM, it can be very effective. Any other questions? Uh, Rosemary, I, let me see. I will try and share mine again, Rosemary. There we go. It's amazing how many people you'll find are sympathetic actually. You know, I at first was, you know, wasn't sure how many people would agree kind of when we started thinking about a city ordinance and so forth, but friends and collaborators just came out of the woodwork. Uh, This this issue really resonates with a lot of people. And there's so many reasons why, right? Bird lovers know why this is a real problem. And then other environmentalists also. And then there's all the health advocates. And then there's the aesthetics of it all. So, and then there's the sustainability issues with energy pollution. So they're just, you'll find a lot of friends. Okay, thank you, Rosemary. She put long-eared and saw what owls migrate. So um, always something new to learn. So, they do in fact migrate. So with that in mind, I don't know the answer nearly as much for what they would do, but I'd imagine because they're stronger flyers, they're probably gonna uh, more than likely probably migrate during the day, but it's entirely possible they could migrate at night. I'm not quite sure myself. So if anyone knows the answer to that, feel free to put it in chat. Otherwise you'd probably Google it too. night. All right. Thank you, Rosemary. So they do migrate at night. So that would be something that affects them as well. Um, I've actually heard recently that um, it's not uncommon for birds to get lost or owls to get lost and confused and to fly into city areas. And once in a while, they'll hit windows too. We actually talked to someone on Wayne campus recently that they found uh, an impression uh, on the window from an owl and they found a dead owl on the ground. So Owls are just as likely to get influenced by the light um, and hit windows, which we don't want to see that. Um, Lori said she's seen short-eared owls migrating in the daytime. That's really always quite fascinating that it could be maybe they did on purpose or maybe they were disoriented and confused. You never really know. Uh, Kathleen put insects are also affected by artificial lighting. So thank you for that, Kathleen. Yes, thank you for mentioning that. And we're having an insect apocalypse too, as you may have heard, uh, which is truly frightening because insects are the bottom of the food chain. Any other questions, comments? Like I said, always something new to learn. So feel free if uh, you know something that maybe corrected us or maybe just something that adds on to what we already said, feel free, we can chime in with that. And, uh, or like I said, more questions. So Rosemary said long eared owls used to come to lighthouse at night at Whitefish Point. So that's really cool. Nice. I have yet to be to Whitefish Point. That'll be on my list sometime soon to go and see. Lori says also hatchling sea turtles are disoriented by artificial light. Yes, what ends up happening is the hatchlings are supposed to go into the water and they look for the glinting of the waves. And instead, if they see the city lights, they end up heading in the wrong direction and then they they die because they can't make it to the sea. Yeah, so there's so many different species that are affected by artificial light that realistically, if we don't need them on anymore, they can be turned off or reduced in a way then it helps. Yeah, speaking of insects, you may have heard of the study last year that showed a huge 
influx of grasshoppers to Las Vegas. Uh, and so they then started dropping in the streets of Las Vegas. And this was attributed to the lights of Las Vegas. Oh, goodness. Yeah. Oh. But, well, we are about five minutes after eight. Um, any last questions? If not, um, we'll probably go ahead and close out uh, and start recording this so that way we can uh, share it with everybody that wasn't able to attend or maybe missed out on portions. Oh. One question, is the uh, dark sky problem increasing? Definitely increasing exponentially, unfortunately. Sorry to hear that. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, with that, if anyone else wants to ask another question, I give you a second. All right, we'll go ahead and we'll conclude. Thank you everybody for joining us. Um, we appreciate all the thanks uh, that you've put in the comments. Um, we're really happy that everyone could join us and hopefully you take a, take something away from this and maybe come up with some solutions, whether it's at your home, at your business, um, or even just maybe with your neighbors, like some people said, uh, every little bit helps that you can do, whether it's small for yourself or in your community. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, thank you, Sally, for leading this presentation. And if you have any questions, feel free to email either of us. Um, like I said, I will share the video once it's done downloading, and I'll share that sometime in the next week or so. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Brittany. All right. Have a wonderful night or evening, everybody, and enjoy it. The weather is supposed to be beautiful this weekend. <laughs>